Mandy, it's uh, I am genuinely very happy you finished to make this happen. Very, very happy. Good I'll, to meet you. Yeah, and you too, finally, after the phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> and then the half hour phone call, uh, this conversation in the car park. Okay. Can you do me a favour, Mandy, and start by giving your... Who you are and your okay. credentials and your you, authorities speak on what we're going to speak about. Okay. Well, I got into the world of trauma um, through my own trauma, really. At the age of 31, 32, I suffered a hemorrhage, a brain hemorrhage, that emptied out into my eye. And I lost the vision of my right eye, my hearing on my right side. I spent three years in what I now know to be traumatic surgery to keep the right side of my face and to retain my eye. Although I lost the vision in my eye, um, I'm happy that I was able to keep it. Um, recovering through that, I needed a change of career. I could not go back to the job I had. I couldn't keep up the pace, so I needed to look for a new career. And I decided to go back to university, and I started off by doing a degree in um, counselling. And that led me into an MSc for psychological trauma and an MA for counselling. And it was through that work, actually, those levels of study. So I was in university for 10 years altogether, um, five of them doing two masters, one of them in psychological trauma, where I sat and read all about trauma in every aspect for five years. I completed my... A thesis, my dissertation on dissociation that I specialize in and realizing the importance of this in terms of what leads people into the criminal justice system and level of risk these people pose within our community and equally the level of treatment they need to be able to recover. So I suppose I am qualified in some ways to talk about trauma at depth um, in this field. Okay, and we are going to be talking about traumatic brain injuries, commonly known as TBIs, which came on my radar, I think I mentioned to you outside, yeah. five or six years ago, and my dad mentioned it, about uh, TBIs relating to, it was an American football player's study, TBIs relating to, uh, uh, it was CT, sorry, and TBIs, and how they can cause mental ill health, right? Absolutely. Now, I've just been on a crash course of 45 minutes of whirlwind lecture from yourself. Outside in the not, car park. Not lecture, yeah, not lecture. <laughs> Can you explain to me, uh, in fact, just to give some context around this, the reason we're talking about PDI, uh, PDIs, TBIs, is because you feel that PTSD is being misdiagnosed mm -hmm. and mistreated. Yeah. Now, in order to get to that and bridge that gap, let's talk about, for the benefit of people listening and watching, Traumatic brain injury, what it is and what the categories are. Okay. If so, you feel that's okay, the right way to yeah, go. Yeah, I think, I think we need to start at the beginning of that, which is with trauma, with PTSD versus complex PTSD, and then lead into traumatic brain injury and blast <clears throat> traumatic brain injury. They're all extremely complex syndromes. And notice that I'm calling them syndromes, not a disorder. Um, PTSD... Um, is really uh, the reaction to a near-death experience where your system has come into close shave and you've stared death in the face. At that point, your whole system comes online. Trauma comes in through your five senses, through your eyes, your nose, your smell, uh, your taste and your touch, vibrational energy. Right now, all those senses are vibrating. And when you're looking at the tiger that's coming into the room that's going to eat you and there is no window for you to escape, you will go into what we call a peritrauma freeze, where your system will then start to decide what to do next. You certainly can't fight the tiger because it's bigger than you and it's stronger than you and it's bigger teeth than you. Uh, and you can't fight, so you can't get out of anywhere. So you then have to just do the best you can. So people who become traumatized in the military, those that we send off to numerous conflicts around the world who go out there risking their own lives time and time again, day in, day out, are facing trauma. They will be facing trauma events. It will be inevitable. As a result of that, certain systems will become breached. And that system 
is sits at the base of your brain in your basal ganglion and it is your 10th cranial nerve your polyvagal nerve and at the point of these systems becoming breached and then becoming overextended because of the intense training that our military do nobody's going to get to the top of the hill and go guess what guys i'm not really up for this today i'm going home you will keep pushing forward no matter what and as a result of that and facing death in the face, we know that those who get traumatized are not the weakest of men and women. On the contrary, they are the strongest within our military today. But as a result of going where angels fear to tread, they've entered into a bracket of life and they've stayed in there too long and they have overstretched their systems. And their polyvagal nerve is not happy. Online comes your dorsal vagal nerve at that point, which will shut you down and you will prepare to die as you come into close contact with no route out. You will dissociate. Dissociation is the ultimate defense mechanism we have. Explain it for me. So dissociation, there are five categories of dissociation, but the categories, I won't go into them in all great lengths, but the two mainly which seem to be affecting our military right now are dissociation amnesia and dissociation depersonalization, depolarization. So di dissociation amnesia is that you lose time and space. And you could be listening to me right now and all of a sudden your mind will wander off and you will space out, um, the lights are on, nobody's home, look. Um, and then you will flip back in. I can see you smiling at me. Does that seem familiar to you? <laughs> Please don't do it through me through this podcast. Um, and you will flip back in and you would have lost time and space. And that can happen quite frequently. So dissociation is the ultimate defense me mechanism we have. It will prepare you to die. At the point of this happening, uh, you can also have dissociated depersonalization, depolarization, where you're not connected to the room, or your arms not connected to your body, you feel so disconnected that you're looking at life through a fog glass window. So it's a bit like, I remember a veteran once describing it perfectly to me. It's like as if I'm wearing a space helmet and life is, I've got a CD playing in my head that's going around and I'm trying to look over my visor to look into life. And I thought that is a perfect example of this level of dissociation. The problem is um, at that point when your whole system shuts you down um, and systems right across um, your your body, not just your head, so your neurophysiological, neuroendocrine, endocrine systems, uh, which will then go out of regulation. And your heart, your respiratory system, um, and your basal ganglion, where the polyvagal nerve sits, comes down your spine, it goes out through into your organs, through your parasympathetic and autonomic sympathetic nervous system, CNS, um, it will all start to dysregulate as you prepare to die. Can I just jump in yeah. uh, for a second? Sorry. So when you were analogizing with the, that's the right word, analogizing with the tiger in a room scenario, and yeah. you said, yeah, you, you, you body, you, your body, your brain doesn't know what to do, and it goes into preparing to die mode. Yeah. So from a military perspective, it, um, you were talking there about in, an involuntary subconscious yeah. response to yeah, it, right? these, because obviously the, yeah. when I was thinking about it yeah. I'm just playing devil's yeah. advocate people think no 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 because I can shoot back and I, uh, I knew I could do this and yeah, I was absolutely fine will. on a conscious level mm. and again from experience from, with counselling it was explaining to me and the, yeah, but this is, uh, consciously you think absolutely fine I dealt with that fine and you know I'd, I'd go back and do it again and yada 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 but on a subconscious level you've just messed with the whole system you've but. just breached every system <laughs> you possibly <laughs> can yeah. exactly yeah. and in doing that um, you didn't die you were supposed to die so your senses were taking in this information and they were processing it at high speed and everything was happening around you and there was no way out mm -hmm. <clears throat> So at that point, your system, your dorsal vagus nerve will shut you down. And as a result of shutting you down, it is then set off a chain reaction across all these systems. But you know that you are extremely tough people. So you will pick yourself up and you will dust yourself off and you will keep going. But you have set off a chain reaction, um, which will keep dysregulating. So in the first month of that happening, 
you will go into acute stress disorder. And at that point, you know, we pretty much need to get you and, and, and stabilize you. But we do something called watchful waiting, where we stand back and we see if your system will come back into regulation. Within a month of the event? Within a month of the event. Okay. But if we look at the way that you operate and the demands which are placed on you, you will be out in these environments for six to nine months, even longer. Some do back-to-back -to -back tours. Some of the patients I have have done back-to-back -to -back tours. So you're not in a stable relation, a st stable environment. You will continue to be in high intensity situations and you will be going back out the next day or back out the same night. Or even if you go back into the barracks to try and rest, you'll be under mortar attacks and your system then is continually online. And your right frontal lobe will say to you, to your body, um, I don't like what you just did to me. Just don't do it again. And it will keep you on alert. So your right frontal lobe becomes your watchtower. And the next time you go out, similar smells and tastes and sounds of the event will trigger that right frontal lobe, which will wake up the polyvagal uh, and the whole process will happen all over again. At the point of that happening and dissociating, you can continue to dissociate out. So it's an involuntary movement. It's not something you can control. So when we look at this, we know that people who are traumatized as I said, are the toughest of people. They have been in the thick of it. They've been right in the middle, near-death experience time and time again. And I think that's, that's why I wanted to come on the podcast and say, look, we need, to, we need to look at this because the wrong message is going out there. We talk about words like stigmatization. We talk about words like resilience. There are big words right now that are being used to, you know, let's, let's, you know, let's get rid of the stigmatization. But by actually saying that word, you're creating a stigmatization. You are, you are giving out the wrong message because if we really educated people into what this is, they would know that they have overstretched their systems across uh, their polyvagal nerve, which is actually controlled by your heart. Your heart is the brake for this. And these, there is a bottom-up process, not a, a sort of top-down process. There is a bottom-up process. The primary of trauma then is, is, is through your spinal, across your CNS, across your organ systems. And your whole dysregulation is what controls you now, not your head. So when we're looking at recovery from this, we should be looking at stabilizing somebody through these systems that have been breached not by sending someone for talking therapy. Right. And so uh, on on that point, in case I think it's been made clear yet, is that um, the crux of the matter is that you are, say you, the research, the science is saying mm -hmm. that PTSD is a neuro physiological condition that's right that's right correct. which is caused by a physical event exactly and and that it should be treated as such absolutely yeah. right yeah. can you so coming back to the cause and we're talking blast we've been talking about blast tbis okay. can we go okay. back and just explain the two different types of tbis that we're talking about just to, again to okay set the groundwork for what okay. we're going to come on to okay so <clears throat> i was seeing quite a lot of guys and girls who had been in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I soon started to realize that a lot of the symptoms that they were displaying to me were not purely because of their PTSD. And at this stage, these people had complex PTSD, repeated trauma events um, that had gone on longer than six months and their systems had manifested. And looking at them, um, I know that through that, they will have a weaker immune system. So they will lead to autoimmune disease. But when I was looking at them, you know, they and I was visiting them in their homes across the country and realizing that, you know, they they had problems making a cup of tea. Um, they had problems remembering the sequence of how to make a sandwich. A lot of them were in role reversal where their wives had had to go out to work and they were at home looking after the children because they couldn't work. And they were taking the children to school every day and they couldn't remember how to get to the school, although it was a it was a walking Jenny, they were taken every day and picking the children up at the end of the school day. And their children were having to direct them and say, no, daddy, it's this way. It's not that way. We need to cross this road and go that way. And they really didn't know how to get to the school. They didn't have <clears throat> enough memory recall. Then I realized that their speech was triggered and that they, they had disfluency. 
and their balance was off. They had spatial problems. They had what with their speech, sorry? Disfluency. So they, they had slow... Disfluency. So they had slow... Or they had difficulty finding the words that they needed to talk about in the sentences. So they were stuttering and some of them, lots of them had hearing problems. Some of them had had fractured, fractured spines um, and their balance was completely off. And I suddenly sat there one day and thought, oh my God, these people don't just have trauma, don't just have complex PTSD at this level. These people have a brain injury. So I started to investigate that more. Um, I started to piece together the symptoms of the clients that I was seeing. And then I went back to see them and I sat down and I said, can you tell me some of the incidents you were involved in? But I don't want you to go into the incident. I want you to look over the incident. I don't want to re-traumatize you through that. So they sort of revealed to me some of the incidents that they'd been involved in. And some of them were clearly um, suffering from traumatic brain injury. So they were sort of, if you like, had moderate or severe traumatic brain injury. And with all these symptoms that were going on with them. And they had been in um, close contact. They had been in vehicles where they had been blown up by a daisy chain and their rifle had gone into their face and they had been sent into the air with their bogan um, and they had ended up with fractured spines and um, hearing problems, tinnitus problems. And then there was the other category that I was looking at that it had been involved in blasts. And it was horrific to see this. To see this in the family home was pretty horrific. And then I'd sort of asked them what had happened to them through transition. Had anybody picked up what it, you know, the incidents against their symptoms? And although their physical injuries had been dealt with for those who had physical injuries, nobody at all had asked them whether or not they were suffering in or investigated any of the symptoms they may have had. And for those with the invisible injuries with no physical symptoms, but definitely um, displaying the symptoms, they had not been asked. They had not been referred anywhere. And then I sort of thought, right, you know, I need to really look at this. So I got access to their military medical notes, which was quite shocking when that happened. There was clearly large elements of these missing clearly segments of their notes which had been taken out really yeah that's and, a bit conspiratorial well go on i have these <laughs> so i was like well how come you know we've got you on this date but then then this incident happened but this incident isn't in your file um so we carried on we carried on looking at this so i sort of sat down and thought you know i, I can't live with this this is wrong this is clearly wrong what's happened here and they clearly had not been the right assessments through transition for these men, or even while they were out in Afghanistan. And I know for a fact that the Americans had the scanners that we needed out there, but and we could have had access to them, but these weren't, we didn't use these scanners. So they had a MEG scanner out in Iraq and Afghanistan, and these scanners were not being used. And these are scanners that can identify yeah. TBI? Yeah, that's why the Americans had them there. So... I then sat down and thought, right, what do we need? That was the next thing. So we need a, a range of scanners to be able to detect this. So I then did, did a lot more research. And I found that um, the real science of this was sitting in the US and that they had advanced this, the science and the research, and that they had some of the answers to this. And I was really shocked by that. I was really quite upset by that, that we had not been doing this. We had not kept up with the science. So I went back um, through the regiment I work for and said to them, you know, we need, we need to do something about this. It's really seriously bad. And a lot of these lads had then, you know, um, were having domestic problems. They'd been, had contact with the police. Um, some of them had been in prison for pretty serious offences. Um, I had been in court a few times, um, giving evidence, uh, giving report, giving professional witness statements. And so the knock on ripple effect of this was huge. So then I went to see, uh, I think it was July 18, no, sorry, July 19, sorry, last year with my colleague, uh, was sent to Andover to meet, uh, the senior medical advisor to the military. 
And we sat down together and I sat there and I sort of relayed this and said to him, you know, how, how come this hasn't been done? How come we're not doing this? And and he was he was a good guy, actually, and he was kind of concerned and uh, read a paper I had written for the Defence Select Committee and said, I, I really do think we need to be doing something about this. It appears that, you know, we're, we're, not up to, we're not up to standard, we're not up to scratch. So he decided that perhaps we needed a summit. So um, discussions carried on, you know, for, for quite a while. Um, and we sort of looked at that um, and I'd sort of discussed with him that we had independently scanned three of the guys that I had that were displaying a brain injury, that I had taken them to Aston Brain Centre and that we had scanned them on a um, T3 fMRI and an MRI and then we um, took them up to Nottingham and we scanned them on an OPM MEG and we scanned them on a T7 fMRI and that we had analysed these results with the algorithm that they use over in the States and that we had found that all three of these men had had a brain injury. So he was like really concerned about this. Physical physical injury caused by the trauma event trauma. or events. Yes, yeah. yeah. So right. so two of them had been involved in a blast. They had been in repeated uh, close vicinity of blasts and one of them was a TBI. What are the injuries? When we're talking about physical injury, what we mm. what, to the brain. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, so when we look uh, so when we look at a TBI, we're talking really that a bang to the head. So you've fallen out of a vehicle or you've thrown yourself out of an airplane and you've parachuted out and you've landed you know on your head or wherever and you've given it a real good jolt or knock to the head or rapid change in pressure absolutely yeah so so again you know lots of you guys play sports within the military so you know when you're out there you know on the rugby pitch or football um or literally through your training as well you know you don't have to be in a conflict to get a tbi you know some of the training you do is extremely intense um so that is a knock to the brain so we know that the brain sits in a fluid on the inside of the skull is um, jagged. So we know that when that brain gets knocked around, um, it's going to rip across some of the inside of the cra of your cranial sort of skull. And that is a kind of uh, damage to white and grey matter. So we know that. But when we talk about a blast injury, um, and you don't really need to be concussed to have a traumatic brain injury. I just we clearly need to say that because um, that is another thing which is happening right now that everybody thinks you need to be concussed. Well, you didn't, you know, you didn't, you came out of that and you, you wasn't, you, you walked away, you know, you wasn't concussed. That's not the case. You can still have a TBI. You don't need to be concussed. So a blast injury is a um, a ripple. So it's a kinetic blast force coming through your body, through your brain and vibrating your brain at high level. So if you're in a building, that kinetic blast will bounce off the sides of that building and keep penetrating your brain and ripple through. And it will continue to ripple through long after the blast is over. And that causes um, micro, micro, micro hemorrhaging in the brain. So the person who discovered this is Professor Daniel Pearls, who um, was given permission by the Pentagon and funded to look at and dissect brains of men who had just died on the front line and who had given permission for their brains to be analysed and flown back over to the States. And he is a wonderful guy, actually. Um, and he is the guy that found the difference, the biomarker difference between traumatic brain injury and blast. So he, um, he is the one that's done that. So if I go back to the discussions we were having with the military, with um, defense medical services. So they realized actually that, yeah, you know, this is, this is, we need to be looking at this and we need to be doing something about this. So we agreed that we would have a summit and we had a summit and I sat down with a colleague and drew up the list of those we needed to invite, the world leaders, the people who sit on the international platform who are really advancing in this work and who have the pathway already set up over in the US, whose research is coming through. So they all flew in uh, and we had a summit on the 15th. Of the January. aim of the summit being? To bring up to speed uh, the military uh, medical um, 
clinicians, physicians in the advancing research in TBI and BLAST TBI. Um, so that was the 15th of January that we did that. And they stood there and they provided uh, their presentations, their latest research. And it was quite remarkable, really, because it was the first time that each one of these scientists had been standing in a room together. Could you believe that? Um, so we had Professor Daniel Pearls, the guy who had dissected brains, who found the biomarker. We had Professor Roland Lee, who is the professor in neuroradiology, who's been um, scanning with Meg over in uh, San Diego. Meg? Um, that is the scanner that can detect brain waves at slower okay. rate. So um, he had advanced this, the um, research for this. And he had also, um, he's the guy that's got the algorithm that we need to detect <clears throat> a BLAST TBI uh, traumatic brain injury, whether it be mild, moderate or severe. And equally, he can detect complex PTSD. He's able to be able to depict the difference on a scanner and be able to tell us and analyze what's going on with somebody's brain. Without even speaking to someone. Without even speaking to Without somebody. Without speaking to them. Yeah. 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 So uh, this, obviously uh, he does speak to them. <laughs> and this is the important thing, yeah, which yeah. I wish I've, made, I've tried to, you know, uh, bring it back to some points is that, um, uh, which is the surprising thing to me in these conversations that we've had is that Pete is is there is a, there is physical there are there is physical representation oh, yeah. in the body of yeah. PTSD it, because it's caused by a physical a neurophysical reaction a neurophysical yeah. reaction event, right yeah. that, this is a, this is the surprising thing to me and it, and again a lot okay. because and I think and, a lot, and it will be for a lot of people listening and okay. I think it's because the whole spectrum of uh, the treatment of mental ill health mm -hmm. is I, it's a not, not a black art. It seems to be extremely complex and hard to pin down what the issue is and what the symptoms are and what the impact on the person is because you have to get it all through. You have to try to identify it all through communicating with the person who's conscious mm. and you communicate with someone who is mentally compromised, right, at whatever Absolutely. level. And yeah. it's very difficult to try and analyse what's going on in your brain because it's like a doctor trying to diagnose him, him, himself. Yeah. It's, not, it's not always going to work out the best. So you can imagine, <laughs> can't you, when these people uh, turn up in a clinic that they they have difficulty communicating, right? But not only that, you know, what really has upset me about the whole direction of the way that these services have gone is that it has taken you away and separated you from the very community in which you came from. So I have this belief that um, there should have been a National Centre for Trauma to be able to respond to military personnel and veterans um, who get traumatised as a result of their service. I don't believe that this should have gone into the NHS at all. And the main reason for that is that you are a unique group of people. You wear a uniform. You are extremely disciplined. You live in a gated community. You speak a different language to everybody else. Um, you've even got your own sense of humour. Um, you have your own discipline structures. But more importantly, um, these are experiences that uh, you've been through which are pretty unique to you. And you draw psychological strength from each other through recovery. And I think it's extremely difficult to then separate that and put it into a clinic where you're sitting next to somebody that's suffering with depression or anxiety or another mental health disorder. And or if you're put in a group where you're expected to discuss these things with somebody else that, you know, you, you, you can't talk about some of the stuff you've been through in an open forum like this. So I think for me, it, it's, that's the reason why I'm coming now is because I'm, I'm getting pretty tired of seeing this uh, and this end result of this right now that's out there in, um, in the UK. And when we had the summit and everybody came to speak and we had uh, Professor Daniel Pearls, we had Professor Roland Lee, we had Dr. Gary Green, who had been, you know, neuroradiologist, who's been in this field for over 30 years um, in the UK. We do have somebody here. And we then had Dr. Mark Gordon, who is the world leader in neuroendocrine endocrine, um, 
And he's the only guy in the world, actually, that can test the system at the level we need to know at the level of dysregulation that that system has been breached at. The, the brain. Yes. Yeah. So the body yeah. system. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so he's the only guy that can draw the bloods and test your neuroendocrine and endocrine system at the level we need. Why is he the only guy? I think, um, I think sort of, it's like anything, isn't it? You know, we have Daniel Pearls, the only guy that's looked and tested and taken apart the brain and looked at and found the biomarker. We have Professor Roland Lee, who's taken that one, one step further in relation to being able to analyze the brains of serving and exam servicemen who have survived a blast and a TBI and developed the algorithm. And then we have Mark Gordon, who has looked at the endocrine system. So they're all specialists within their own right. Um, and I think really when we look at anything that's advanced in any way, shape or form in the science, it's usually been one person that's done it and then others which are followed later. So these people attended the summit and we also had Ben Dunkley um, from Canada who is looking at special forces over there right now and doing quite a, res a lot of research with them in terms of TBI and BLAST. And they presented on the day. <clears throat> so it was a, an amazing opportunity um, for people to take the science firsthand. And, um, and it was actually the Surgeon General who funded that day um, and paid for them to come over and, and listen to science from the horse's mouth. Can I ask a question before you go on? Because some of what we're talking about, and, and I'm now agreeing with you on, right? I okay. know, or, or, or learning from you on, right? Beginning to agree. Is contradicting my own previous thoughts on PTSD. I know. Which I've, I've talked about you know, a couple of times on, on you. For example, mm. I've, I, I think I've, I've a few times is where I've said, um, and I was, of the, um, potentially I'm still of the belief, but you're going to persuade me otherwise, I think, okay. is that... Uh, PTSD can be caused by uh, different levels of a trauma mm -hmm. can either can impact people in different ways, right? Absolutely. And PTSD yeah. can can cause that. But w I've I've one of the uh, sort of anecdotal stories I've used to explain that away is that I I know people can go in, uh, you know, being a hideous contact in wherever, name a place on, on an operation and and be absolutely fine and oh appear to be fine but they're absolutely fine and they have never a problem again in their life and then i know members of the civilian community they could be who walk out and they nearly get hit by a car they don't get hit by the car they nearly get hit by the car and they're traumatized for life and i and i and, and it's like a P, the, the pts and i okay. said that's ptsd now what you're saying is there has to be a physical for ptsd there has to be a, 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 phys, a neurophysiological no there has to be a physical event right to cause a neurophysiological condition. That physical event can be a, like be a near death experience. an explosion. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yeah, but, but not just a near death experience. Trauma, you know, you can you can get the bad news right that, you know, come Thursday you might not be making Friday. And we need to take you for surgery and we don't know if you're gonna survive that surgery. So that's like, you know, being told that, you know, you might not make it. So that's a trauma. That that is a trauma. So you could be, be given the bad news. Yeah. You could be sitting at home actually watching something, believe it or not, on the television and become traumatized by something which is in front of you and it is just so overwhelming. And that can cause PTSD. That can cause PTSD. Right, see this is what I don't understand. Okay. So how does that what is no physical impact okay. or change, how does that affect there's, there's a physical neurophysiological okay. uh, result? So so that triggers your senses and puts you on alert, which then is a neurophysiological chain reaction from that that happens next. So you can be you can be at the front line, you know, under heavy fire, you know, no way out. You can be um you can be raped, you can be involved in a car accident you can, various levels of abuse, which can cause trauma. Okay. I get, I, do you know what? Yeah. I, do you know what I'm doing is I'm mixing, I'm generalizing with TBI. I am forgetting blast TBI, okay. mild TBI. Yeah. Whereas the blast TBI that results in the physical, the physical evidence yeah. on the brain of blast TBI and indications of PTSD. Okay. Well, 
So let's look at it. Let's help you there. Okay. Because it is extremely complex and it's like, oh my God, there's so much of this. Okay. So let's keep it in its each diagnosis. Let's keep it where it needs to be. So we know that if you are involved in a near-death experience um, and you recover, you could get PTSD. Not everybody will get PTSD. It depends on one word, and that is perception. It's the way you looked at it. Perception is made up of lots of different uh, characteristics um, of your belief system. Um, so it just depends on, on the person, really. So each person's trauma is unique to that person. So you may go into PTSD, you may not go into PTSD. Trauma um, sits on what we call a trauma tree. So there is car accidents, rapes, uh, combat, um, abuse. There's different levels of abuse. There's domestic abuse, there's violence abuse. There's uh, physical, verbal, emotional abuse. Um, and we know that um, people who have been traumatized over long periods of time Trauma, which is drip fed in, has the biggest effect on someone. Okay. So, so that's trauma. And that includes disability, which actually sits on the top of the trauma tree, believe it or not. So people who have to continually adjust and adapt their lives each day through their own disability or through an acquired disability, that those people can become traumatized. Is that the same for someone who's born disabled? Yes, it can be. Yeah. 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 So therefore, trauma can affect anybody at any time. It, it doesn't really pick any class or gender. It has no, it's not sort of um, focused on any member of the population. It can be anybody at, anybody t- at any time can become traumatized. And that trauma then comes in through those senses and creates a neurophysiological reaction, a neurophysiological reaction, which goes across your CNS, your central nervous system, across your organ system, through your heart, your respiratory system, every system is affected, your neuroendocrine endocrine system. At the point of that hitting you, you will go into an acute stress disorder where we need to stabilize you and look after you. And just stand back and watch to see if your system will come back into regulation. If it does not come back into regulation, you will go into PTSD. If you are in an environment where you cannot get out, so if you're in a home where you're continually being sexually abused or abused in any way, physically, violently or verbally, long traumas that are drip fed in, you will end up with complex PTSD. And then it's the The, same for the the military. The difference being that you then set off a higher level of dysregulation across those systems, which can't be reversed. So you will end up with autoimmune disease. So the first few on the hit list are usually heart problems, asthma, skin irritations, repeated chest infections, um, irritable bowel syndrome and pneumonia. So when someone sits in front of me, I kind of normally say, you know, do you have any of these? And that normally gives me a marker of where that person is and where their system, the level of dysregulation they have. And then, you know, you normally notice somebody's respiratory system is out, so their breathing isn't regulated, and they're usually losing their eighth or ninth breath. So their whole system is out of regulation. So that's complex PTSD. We know that for those who have been in extreme situations where they are nearly going to die, that they will dissociate. So we now know that their trauma is at the acute level because they can dissociate. Uh, There is no drugs on the market right now for dissociation. There is no treatment for dissociation. Smells can knock you back into your limbic system. Um, But if we can regulate your system and keep that system at a a lower uh, level of regulation, then we can reduce the dissociation. So your whole system then is fighting against itself, trying to get back. It's a bit like a Rubik's Cube where all the colors are, are sort of mixed up. And your neuroendocrine, your endocrine, your neuro, neurological, your neurophysiological systems, all across those systems um, are trying to get back, are trying to regulate back. And that is causing damage. So when we look at that, we need a different approach. So we know that at that level, there is a bottom up processing, not a top down processing. So your system's controlling you, you are not controlling it. So your trauma controls you, you don't control it. 
And that's so, the parasympathetic over t- overriding yeah, over, this over tipping, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. And okay. it's your and it's your dorsal vagus nerve which has completely shut you down. So we have to get you back into regulation. So the sooner we get you, the better this is. If we let that go on for years and years and years, manifesting at a huge, huge height, then the damage will be far more extensive than what I've just listed there. So that then seeps out into risky behaviors. So you become a risk to yourself, you become a risk to others, um, and you don't have any control over that. It is controlling you at that level. So that is trauma. That is PTSD, complex PTSD, that is trauma. When we look at brain injury, which I was beginning to recognize in a lot of my patients, was that, you know, they couldn't even make a cup of tea. I went into one house and there was just post-it pads everywhere. Remember to turn the light, remember remember to feed the cat, remember to feed the children, you know, um, and there was alarms going off every time with lists of things for them to do, even like how to make a sandwich. And... And I was beginning to realize that a lot of these issues were safeguarding issues. They were looking after children, young children, and um, not able to even cross the road with them to take them to school. Quite extreme, right? Yeah, so we have this right now. This is what's going on right now in our society right now. And I'm not just going to say for hundreds, I'm going to say for thousands that are out there that were involved in these incidents. Um, So it's really concerning that there is no pathway for these individuals who are like this. So before we come back to the, the summit, which mm-hmm. we will come back to, um, let's okay. come back on to um, the uh, blast TBI yeah. being a cause, the, co- the cause of PTSD. I don't think it's the cause. I think they come together. Okay. I think what Daniel Pearls found uh, with the brains that he had dissected was that all of them that he had found had PTSD. And that at the point of impact of that trauma hitting, equally as the blast, these individuals were traumatized. And that is where it becomes difficult for us to be able to assess. And, and uh, But with the assessment can get easier if you know what you're looking for on a physiological level, right? Well, with it gets easier if you're qualified to know what you're looking for. Right, yeah. 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 So, so in terms of uh, treatment for PTSD, and we're, and we're talking military specific now. Okay. Right. Uh, in terms of treatment for PTSD, no. How should it be getting done for blast TBI, PTSD related to blast TBIs? Well, first of all, we, we definitely need to take a history. We need to know what the the incident that people are in. Okay, so we, we measured it on sort of three levels. How big was the hit? Okay, so I'm, I'm not really interested in people who are going to like, wait for the symptoms to develop and stick their hand up and go and speak to somebody. That is the wrong assessment for these individuals. That is too late at that stage. So the real assessment that we need to be doing is we need to be looking at the incident that the, that the individual has been in or the operation that somebody's been involved in or even the training that these people are involved in. And we need to then measure them against the incident. So how big was the hit? Yeah. Um, so, and how intense was that hit? Then we need to look at the level of, um, disconnection they have. So we need to sit them down in front of us and look at if there's any symptoms which they have from the incident that we need to be looking at. And then from the incident itself, if they've been in a huge blast within 10 meters of that blast, then we need to be scanning these individuals on a MEG scanner and across other scanners to just check their brains out to make sure that um, they've not got any permanent damage. I mean, for, from a practical point of view, when we're talking about when you're talking about how big how big is the hit and measuring that, it's impractical to go and do that in a, in a uh, in a sort of ad hoc way afterwards on a case by case basis, isn't it? it, it huge... You're talking about it has to be a it has to be a systematic change in the monitoring we do of our military yeah. so you go and conduct a live firing exercise for example or you're involved in a contact whichever mm. or whatever, whichever size yeah. shape or form yeah. and as yeah. part of the procedure i know we've referenced it before you've got the trim side of things as part of the after action review you know or after action assessment of the troops should be could I be think, yeah, part I, of I what think, you're I th- talking yeah, about exactly right? i think we're better educated now. catch all yeah it's a science the science is there 
right? So, so the science is not up for debate. The research has already been done. Sometimes okay. these days, I think you might struggle to say to, to get people <laughs> to believe that. <laughs> well, we have it. It's in black and white, and it's already been done. So it was spoken about at the summit. They were there, and they 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 give out their research. It's already been done, and the pathways are already set up. So yeah, you're absolutely right, though, Hugh. Because what we need to be thinking about, we need to be more box clever. We need to be better educated. So we need to educate people in this at the level that we know it and how it operates. And then once we've educated people through it, we need to look at how they operate. So how uh, what's their working practices? What do they look like? Um, how do we need to sort of adapt that or in sort of or better educate that to safeguard people who are going into these types of operations or this level of training? How are other people? How are other people doing it? What came out in the summit? Well, the pathways they have over in the States is that uh, now Dr. Matt Gordon works with Delta over there and is now speaking to the Pentagon <clears throat> about his work. And this has been going on for a good few years where we just take a blood draw of somebody and look at their level of dysregulation in their, across their neuroendocrine endocrine system at the level that he does it at, which is much higher than anybody else. So here we might look at two or three markers. Uh, he looks at 30 or 40, and he's able to translate them in how they're all interacting together to be able to give us the printout of any re dysregulation. And if there is any level of dysregulation, then there is a protocol, a treatment that he uses, uh, which is all natural stuff. It's not synthetic pharmaceutical um, SSRIs or anything like that to get that hormone system back into regulation. Can you give me an example, expand on any of that? So um, he looks right across neuroendocrine and endocrine markers. And so he will then be looking at the hormone system. So then he will be looking at hormone replacement for some of those gaps, if he finds any, which have happened. If there's hormone deficiencies yeah, caused by the neurophysiological condition from exactly. the blood. Okay. See Hugh, you were getting into it already. <laughs> You'd be qualified at the end of this. <laughs> Absolutely. So so that's what he does. So he's now, you know, so we can put some of these assessments in already and we can do that. So that that's a good way of like getting that system back into regulation. And then we just need to kind of keep an eye on people who have been in these events. And we need an open door policy for them to be able to come in and out quite freely to say, you know, um, I'm not doing too well or, or we need to keep checking at what, the, what they've been involved in and we need to keep bringing them in and just checking them out. But yeah. we have that now. We have the open door policy. What's, Do wrong, what's wrong with it? Well, it's the wrong open door. Unfortunately, it's the wrong door Go on. Um, because it's being treated as, as a mental health disorder and we've just described trauma as a neurophysiological disorder. So we have the sit down chat, how you're feeling, you know, what's going on. Um, okay, you're not too great, then let's send you, you know, down to see, you know, the um, psychologist who's going to give you six, seven sessions of CBT and you can talk about it and you can change your automatic negative thoughts to positive uh, aut aut automatic thoughts. And, you know, you can talk your way better, you know, but that's like giving talking therapy to somebody who has cancer. It's the same principle. They're not going to get better. They need a different level. Really? Yeah. There's no help whatsoever yeah. in that yeah. way. No, no, not at be. all. No, 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 no. Look at the figures. Look at the results. Um, what, what are the outcomes of these departments? Uh, some of them we don't know. Uh, they don't give their outcomes. But we know that the, um, the immediate access to psychological treatment, IAPT, usually has between a 56, 58 failure rate. You put military personnel into that system who have been re-traumatized time over time over time over again with possible TBI, with possible blast injury. And I want to throw something else into the mix here, which is, which is something we need to be talking about, which is um, an ugly subject right now, but the neurotoxicity as well. People who took mefloquine, larium, uh, who, are seek who have the adverse effects of this, horrific adverse effects from this drug. Um, so you put people into that system and you can actually re-traumatize them. You send people to a system that doesn't understand them, who is not assessing them to the level and the standard that is required here for our military personnel in the UK and our veterans. 
then you make them worse. And there is a term for that. We call it sanctuary trauma. The people you go to who don't understand you who make you worse. And that's happening quite a bit in our system right now. And that is pushing people further into their trauma towards suicide. And it is quite serious. So we look at people in the TBI bracket, in the blast bracket, that are high levels. We know that these people are more high risk to suicide, including people in the complex PTSD bracket. These are horrific um, symptoms to live with. This is going, what you're saying is going straight against the grain, uh, straight against the thinking of what most people think about the treatment of We'll talk about PTSD. Mm. Um, well, let's say you know, we're talking about PTSD because the first uh, people immediately think that it's a mental health disorder, uh, as, as well as I do. But the treatment of it, uh, part of the treatment of it, and to be honest, my up to this point, sort of my preferential go to, not not me personally, just generally speaking, would be the counselling side of the things. I've got friends who have do the counselling, there are medication and one. all sorts of <laughs> shit, right? Um, and what you're saying is going completely against the grain of that. Oh, just, are we, so PTSD, is all PTSD a, a neurophysiological, a neurophysiological disorder? Yes. Right. And so that is to say then, correct if I'm wrong, okay. that is to say that PTSD, the primary treatment for PTSD should be physiological yeah it should be first of all neurophysiological Neuro- we should be we should be look we should be educating that person in what's just happened to them yeah okay so they know they're not going mad and that this is a um normal reaction to a near-death experience and we should be explaining that to them and that's explaining it at, on the level of the science and what we know and the research which is out there so i'm you know i'm not saying anything that that you couldn't go away and Google right now. Okay, so people are listening to this and they want to Google it. Google the polyvagal nerve, okay? It, it makes Google, sense to me. Yeah. Google, you know, Google um, polyvagal arrest, you know, po- Google these <coughs> these words. Excuse and, me. And First bless- time I sneeze on the podcast. That's what happens with all this controversy. <laughs> <laughs> bless you. you. So, so you can go away and you can read this stuff. So, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not really saying anything that is not out there that you couldn't just Google from the laptop in your living room. Okay, so yeah, so the first level of um, the first level of response, shall we say, to this, is really to stabilise someone. That's so important that we do that. Where the system has has gone over the acute stress disorder, moved out of PTSD, and it, and we and then we haven't been able to regulate them through that, and they've gone into complex PTSD. These people need regulating first and foremost they do not need talking therapy and this can be done without the use of synthetic drugs and anything else Absolutely, right yeah because okay. synthetic, that's where my my yeah, the hairs yeah, of the back of my neck stand up and think hang on we're going down the medication first before other things but it's not what we're not talking no about the medication the medication route sometimes and I'm not going to knock this because everybody will be jumping up and down out there now anyway. But, you know, I'm not going to say, <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that some drugs, you know, that are, that are there that are, we can't use to stabilize people. But then, you know, what we're seeing in the system is that their, their drugs are being increased and constantly increased as their symptoms are manifesting. Their drugs, their synthetic drugs, their antipsychotic drugs, their SSRIs are being increased. It seems to be the first protocol. Um, and that only, um, complicates that system even further. It then goes into the mix. Your neurotransmitters that are completely out of regulation, these drugs will knock it out of regulation even further and mix it up uh, even further. And we don't even know um, some of the long-term effects of these drugs. So what we need to do is go back to the science and go back to what we know uh, what it's telling us and the level of dysregulation and we need to look at the right systems which are dysregulating and do the right assessments for that. Bring those systems back to the baseline as through far, the use, as far as through we can, the yeah. use of yeah. Yeah, administering natural, 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 the natural, yeah, natural drugs. But yeah. also we were, when we were speaking in the, the car park of knowledge earlier okay. on, okay. when we were, <laughs> we were out there talking, you also referenced... so the beginning of the podcast you talked about blast tbis and the physical damage the scarring on the on the i don't think we spoke about it much but you yes, talked about the, yeah, the phys- phys- physical impacts on it yeah. when we were outside talking you mentioned the treatment that if caught early enough so again early identification yeah. of a tbi a blast yeah. tbi that there's a treatment that can um 
mend that scarring so it does not become permanent and it, then does not Im- cause the it complex. Can, it can yeah. improve it slightly, yeah. Oh, okay. So, so we know um, that... Let's go back to the Rubik's Cube. So now all these systems are dysregulated. Whether you're traumatized or whether you've got a traumatic brain injury, but if you've got a traumatic brain injury, we know you're going to have um, complex PTSD with that. Same with the blast. So, so we've got all these symptoms kicking off and we've got the whole system dysregulating. So first and foremost, we need to do some blood draw on and find out about that. But for a blast TB, TBI and for, for a, a TBI as well, uh, Professor Roland Lee has really advanced um, the treatment in this section and he has developed um, transcranial uh, magnetic, um, let me just get this, I always get this. Uh, so yeah, so he has developed um, transcranial magnetic stimulation for people who have a blast or a TBI and he's also developed transcranial deep cranial uh, stimulation. Uh, where people go in and they have, depending on which part of the brain has shown the damage on um, from the imaging scans, which he has done, um, this is quite amazing. When you see it on a computer screen, you're looking at a 3D image of a brain that's rotating and it's, and it's really highlighting in different colors areas of that brain which is damaged. So then he can bring people in and he gives them this treatment Um, And he places it on the area of the brain, which has shown up slow brain waves to really try and um, regenerate the brain. And he is getting some amazing results with this treatment. But that's not all the treatment we need, because we know that the whole system, you know, your head's connected to your body, your body's connected to your head. It's all sort of there's a bi-directional process there, which is going on. So we know that, you know, we need to equally treat your trauma as well as your brain injury. And the two are interacting against each other. So we need to sit down and look at the whole person holistically, not just your head, not just your body. We need to look at the whole person and see how that is interacting. And then the other thing which is difficult is that each person's trauma, including their brain trauma, is unique to them. So we cannot compare one person's brain trauma or trauma to the next. So we have to treat it individually. So it's no good setting up a sort of treatment program which takes you down a few of these treatments thinking that person is going to get better. Can I just jump in? You, you've you mentioned a couple of times there you have to look at the trauma and the brain injury together. Yeah. Right, just when you're, talk, when you're using the word trauma... I'm talking about complex PTSD. Are sorry, you talking about yeah. the emotional aspect, the the, the, the mental emotional aspect? Well, compared, and when you're saying brain injury, you're talking about the physiological. So, 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 Hugh, we're talking about neurophysical, physiological, physiological damage which has been caused by their trauma. So, so the symptoms. The trauma being the event, the experience. When, yeah, you, when you're yeah. using the word trauma, you mean the experience, yeah. right? Got you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, it's fine. So. We need to look at both. We can't just look at one in isolation. And if we're not asking these individuals who um, are not getting better, you know, where you involved in a blast, you know, if you ever hit your head in, in training or in, in your military career, if we're not doing the full assessment at the gate, then those people will just go off down the wrong path of treatment. And then these people seem to become treatment resistant or too complex to treat. That's what a lot of my patients have come to me and said, that I've been through the NHS revolving door. I've been through TILS. I've been through CTS. You know, I've seen these clinicians who are looking at me. If they can't believe I'm not getting better, then it becomes my problem. So I'm treatment resistant or I'm too complex and they can't treat me and they've discharged me. That is not good enough. We need to be asking further questions at the gate of what's happening and and we need people who are qualified to be able to assess at this level so the crux of the matter is correct me wrong is that the many many people suffering from ptsd or symptoms of ptsd are uh, undiagnosed they are not receiving the best possible treatment or even the correct treatment they should be exactly okay now We've got about 15 minutes left. Okay. Let's come back to the summit. we only got halfway through the summit. Okay. What happened at the summit? Well, it was quite exciting. You know, I really believed for the first time after years of campaigning for this, um, realizing it, the shock of realizing what I was looking at within my patients, looking at the ripple effect, the devastation effects of how that then rips families apart, um, 
the people who have trauma, who have PTSD, complex PTSD in the military, who don't have a brain injury, but were taken, or are being taken down the wrong path. And then watching the fact that they've got nowhere to go in the system, that, that just leaves them being called too resistant or too complex to treat. And then realizing about the brain injury side and the neurotoxicity side of larium and mefloquine, and that these individuals are in a system where they've got no chance at all of any level of assessment that they need, including the men who are still in the military who may be having the effects through their training, and women, yes, of course, sorry, and women. So I thought for the first time ever, we, we've got the whole top range, the best range of um, scientists who sit on the international platform who are leading this research. And one would have hoped that um, people would have embraced that, shall we say, in the way that one would have expected in a professional manner. So the summit ended, people heard what was, what was said, and it was left down to Imperial College to write up the report and to report on the consensus that was reached on the day that we really did need to use MEG. Uh, to assess and that we needed to consider the level of neuroendocrine and endocrine that Dr. Mark Gordon had presented on the day, whose results of his work speak for himself. He works with Delta and lots of other military personnel out there. But unfortunately, that did not happen. So a report was published. Um, the draft report was circulated to all members who attended the day. Uh, an imperial writing this report on behalf of DMS? Yes, they were. Okay. Yeah. yeah, They were facilitating the day and writing the report. So when I first read the report, um, I was quite shocked. It didn't really <clears throat> reflect what had been presented. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And... I sort of contacted Imperial because I'd been part of the organizing committee for this with a colleague and two others. Um, so I wasn't really, I was quite concerned. So I sort of sent emails raising my concerns about this. What was the issue specifically with the report? So, that, vital was it parts stuff being omitted? Of, yeah, no. yeah. It was vital parts of the science had been left out. Go on, like what? So, for instance, Dr. Mark Gordon's section of the report had been completely rewritten into something else. And he had sent corrections himself. So I got copied into these emails that went to Imperial to say that um, this was not what I presented. Can you please change the report to what I presented? Here is a section that I have rewritten for you to change it with. And this is what I presented on the day. And this is the science. And... That didn't get changed. How are they allowed to do that? Well, yeah, I'll come back to that okay. in a minute. And then why would I they want to? What the point? But we'll come back to that. And then, and then I sort of um, quite serious actually um, that I'd got copied into an email from Professor Roland Lee to Imperial, um, who had um, asked for a sentence to be put in to say that actually we do have a biomarker using MEG for TBI and blast TBI and that we can detect the difference of these diagnoses by using MEG and equally we can detect someone's level of PTSD, complex PTSD. And that sentence didn't get put in. So the narrative of this report got changed. And I sent numerous emails to Imperial raising my concerns Equally, I sent emails to Defence Medical Services about this report. Um, people who attended the day were asked to sign as authors on this report, and I refused to sign as an author because um, the corrections sent by eminent speakers who presented on the day, who were leading on the science, who sent their corrections through, were ignored. And as a result of that, this report got written into a different narrative. And the recommendations that come out of this report are saying that we need more research when we don't need more research. The research has already been done and the pathways can already be set up. So I was extremely quite upset about this. Um, and as a result of speaking out, obviously, that has not gone down well. And 
The report is now published. It's on the Imperial website, um, but it actually fails to report on the accurate science that was reported on the day. Has anyone else piped up and complained about this? Raised yeah, concerns? Yeah, actually, they have, actually. A few of my colleagues, a few of presenters piped up and complained and did not want to put their names down as authors on this report. One in particular... Uh, who wrote an email to say, please remove my name from this report. I, I cannot put my name to this. It is not a true reflection of what was presented on the day. And a few others removed their names. These individuals, I believe afterwards, were telephoned by Defence Medical Services Department and they were persuaded to put their names on the report. One individual um, was actually told that um, they know that perhaps it does not reflect the day um, and that they're not going to take the recommendations forward in this report. And, um, you know, but we would really like you to put your name on it anyway. But we just want you to know that we're not going to take the recommendations forward in this report. And I just think, you know, that we cannot live in a society where this level of behaviour continues. What's the issue, Mandy? I, explain the issue to Politics. Me. I, go, um, go on. I think it's politics. Everything, whether we like it or not, there's always a politics in the room. So these universities have um, led on research for the military for years and years and years, and they have received massive amount of money for doing that. And in doing that, you know, they, 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 today's research is tomorrow's services. So they dominate what gets delivered um, for you guys um, and the level of assessments, everything actually, including the guidelines of so what we need to practice too. When you say dominate research, mental health research you're talking about? Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, mainly. So, so you know, they have their own, I suppose, vested interest in wanting to keep the status quo and control what's in and what's out. Um, but I think, you know, looking across society of where we are today within the military and veteran and the legacy cases we have left over, not just from Iraq and Afghanistan, but other conflicts of war, we have thousands of you know, men, women who fought for this country, you know, who are willing to give their life. And we're very, very lucky to have got them back. And if we keep reporting the wrong narrative just because of individuals' vested interests, then I'm afraid then that has to be exposed. And, that, and that's why I've agreed to speak today. talk about the narrative what do you mean what you what you what you're referring to there so the narrative i'm referring to is you fail to present the facts you fail to present the science okay okay yeah. so let me let me look at let me put it this way okay when the writing's on the wall and you don't want to read it you'll change it to something you do want to read and that's a that's a defense mechanism actually it's called sublimation so they change the writing on the wall to read something they did want to read. I know, a good president does. Very good at it. Very good at <laughs> sublimation. I don't know which president I'm talking so, about. But, so but there's, why... there's also something, you know, um, the other thing here that we have is psychiatry versus neurology. So for years and years and years, these departments, psychiatry has led on all of this, when actually this isn't psychiatry, this is neurology. So these disorders and the reaction from these disorders sit in the neuro neurophysiological world. They don't sit in the world of psychiatry. And although they may display psychiatric symptoms, that's not where they sit. They belong in neurology. So if you have departments in psychiatry that have led on this research for years and years and years and have written what they want to read on the wall, not what the science is telling us, then they control the landscape. Isn't, isn't not... And the, and the money <laughs> is it not fair it makes sense that i can see that this, i was going to ask um before you mentioned psychiatry versus the, the neurology i was going to ask what why why bringing the neurophysiological aspect into it would be threatening to an imperial college but if i understand this right it's the psychiatric sort of sections departments of yeah. these organizations yeah. that i mean when we talk about the summit they headed up that summit, they organised it on behalf of DMS, so they're predominantly embedded in the psychiatric world and neuroscience threatens yeah, that whole yeah, yeah. expertise. Well, is it fair to say, though, that uh, when we're talking about the treatment of PTSD, that uh, the the psychiatric treatment isn't a hindrance completely? It is, yeah. Is it? Is it? Yeah, it is. Right now it is. When you look at, go away, right, sit down tonight at home and start Googling some stuff. 
Google complex PTSD. Okay. Google blast traumatic brain injury. Google traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. Look up Daniel Pearls. He's on YouTube. You can listen to him. It's fantastic to listen to. Look at the science, the research, which is coming out of the States by Roland Lee, by Dr. Mark Gordon, who have advanced in this. Look up Stephen Porsche, who sits in the University of Illinois, who is the guy that discovered the 10th cranial nerve and its reaction in trauma, the source of the Nile. And it's there. It's in black and white. So I'm not this kind of witch with a light bulb that's, that's saying this. You can actually go away and read about it. And that is where we need to be sitting with this, not not thinking that it is some psychological behavioral issue that you can talk your way out of, because it isn't. And that is the level of distress that that, that sort of attitude is causing when a lot of people who are traumatized and, you know, in the military who are in repeated trauma events, who are highly traumatized, perhaps some of them who are in the complex bracket, who are going for this treatment, and it's not really touching. For so you is, you is, that's the kicker. Yeah. Is that, and again, um, well, well no, I'll leave that, but no, there is the kicker. Is that, um, you, you're essentially saying that the, the counseling, the, the course is being provided because that's what is thought to be the correct thing to, to the psychiatry treat, you know, and the research the psychiatry in psychiatry is in not this country. effective yeah. for PTSD. No, not effective. Um, I think I think you need a wider eclectic treatment regime, okay, and but it, it wouldn't involve psychiatry. It would involve a level of therapy, okay, and there are different models of therapy that we can apply for this, but the levels of um, therapy that we are applying at this level will not touch first base. No. Can we? Go a bit deeper into that. Can you just expand on it a bit, please? Okay, so when I talk about a wider eclectic treatment regime, you need a whole host of eclectic therapists who can work across various different models. But first and foremost, who under who are qualified in trauma, we have to have people have to have a formal qualification to be able to work in trauma. So at this level, you need a wider eclectic treatment regime, you need to understand the Rubik cube, and it's and how it's changing, you need to understand the Enigma code. So people who are trauma specialists, normally are code breakers, they can work across and understand what's going on in front in, with somebody's neurophysiological, neuroendocrine, endocrine, and um, sort of different systems across which have been gone out of dysregulation. Then we need to look at people's belief systems. Obviously, you know, you've been through a trauma event, you're not going to come out of it the same. And it's then that talking therapies can come in. But that, again, has to be in a special way, you know, that's not just six sessions of CBT changing your negative automatic thoughts to positive automatic thoughts. You know, there's a degree of loss here that people have encountered through their trauma. And loss is, is um, we can, we talk about traumatic loss. So again, there's various treatments, which we can apply at different stages of somebody's recovery. So we need a whole eclectic group of people in the room together that can do this level of assessment to recover somebody from these events so the, the therapy can be a benefit the issue is at the minute is that it is the blanket uh, it's, it's too narrow the blanket and go to yeah. it's the blanket and go to treatment that's being issued and for the most case yeah. Yeah. of blast tbi uh, PTSD caused by blast tbis it is not the right treatment or it's an ineffective treatment there is no pathway right now in the uk at all whether you're inside the military or whether you're outside of the military there is no pathway for anybody whether you are military or civilian who may be suffering a traumatic brain injury contrary to belief that doesn't exist we have no pathway for anybody that's been in a blast a traumatic um, injury who has a blast traumatic injury there is no pathway it doesn't exist so then I want to throw something else in Hugh before we finish which is really important here which I haven't said up to now so if you've been in the military and you have served your country and you have had these near-death experiences and you have come out and you have complex PTSD and you have blast injury and you have a traumatic brain injury and you have a neurotoxicity uh, injury as a result of taking methylcanolarium you have nowhere to go for an assessment. So if you have nowhere to go for an assessment at this level, then you cannot be properly or accurately diagnosed. 
Therefore, there is no treatment for you. But then I want to take it one step further and I want to say that there is no written report for you for you to be able to go and claim compensation for your injury. So these men and women who are the toughest, the toughest, the ones who were out there, who have risked their lives time and time again, who went where angels fear to tread, stayed in that bracket too long and ended up with this level of injury, I've got nothing. They have nothing. They have no pathway and they are not able to claim compensation. So I have patients who are at home right now whose wives are trying to hold the household together. I have men who have lost their families who don't have access to their children with no report to show social services or the courts what's wrong with them. I have men in custody suites who've been arrested because they've threatened, made, made, made threats to people's lives because they're thinking they're in Afghanistan or Iraq or in previous wars. I have people in, sitting in prisons tonight in a prison cell who have ended up there. And these are the toughest of our men and women. They are the absolute most disciplined. They have performed their duties through choreographed precision timing. They have risked their lives time and time again. And the only reason that they have returned is through luck, because they're lucky. And I think it is not acceptable that we have no service for any of these individuals right now in our society. That is the reality of what's out there right now. And there's plenty of evidence. There's the evidence from the summit. There are the emails of the corrections that were sent by eminent speakers who presented, corrections that were left out of this report. That is not acceptable. There are individuals who are seeking help through these departments and who can't get anywhere. And there are men who've lost their homes. And that is the reality of the situation right now. What other nations are taking this stuff seriously? As in, the, the, obviously the US are. But I mean, this new information, this new this evidence from the research that is pointing to the neurophysiological causes of PTSD. It's not that new. You might be you might be surprised to know that this is not that new. I went to university because if I say this, you'll know my age. But I went to university <laughs> some sort of you know twenty years ago. You know, and I started reading this stuff. You know, and I sat there one night late reading all these research papers, realizing that we were digging in the wrong place. That this is extremely complex. It's like the Rubik's cube, and it's continually changing, and it's neurophysiological. All those systems. I don't want to keep saying it that we've just been talking about. And I sat back and I thought, oh, my God, you know, is it any wonder that the IAPT model has got like a 58, you know, percent failure rate? And that's for like depression and anxiety and low level disorders. Trauma has nothing to do with depression or anxiety. They are side orders of trauma. They are. They don't define the trauma. They're symptoms of. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They're side orders. So, again, you know, we have we, we see new psychiatric um diagnosis out of this like uh, you know stress stress reaction or you know or traumatic reaction um to a trauma you know so so the disorder gets <laughs> sidelined through psychiatry when actually um it shouldn't be sitting there it's a neurological disorder so the million dollar question right now is with people listening and watching and i'm actually one of them listening and i've re referenced someone outside you know i want to go to him after this and say hey I've just uh, done a flipping podcast, I think. <laughs> Where, what with, okay. I mean, there's no existing pathway now, but I mean, for someone uh, who's suffering PTSD, complex PTSD, or maybe have issues and they're unsure, but they've been exposed to tra traumatic blast, to a traumatic blast injury, probably got mm -hmm. it. What do they do right now? What's, what, what's well, the advice? There, there is nowhere. So, so we continue to raise issue with this, actually. You know, we... We looked at the recommendations and I've had I've read some communications which has which has come back to us about from the medical defense services on what they intend to do, um, which which then would kick this into the long grass. So they're on about doing further research. So we don't need to do further research. It would kick this further into the long grass for the next five to six years. The research is there. It's not up for debate. Um, it's been done. You've listened to it. Uh, we can set up the pathway now and we can start bringing these individuals in to give them the full assessments that they need and start educating them and their families and, and give their families the support that they need. It's extremely disappointing, to say the least, that that did not happen after the summit. So I'm taking that to the Defence Select Committee early September 
uh, with the evidence um, and I am putting it on the table and I am saying we're still where we are. We're no further forward and this is why. So if anything, it has exposed the behaviour of individuals in the system that needed to be exposed in order to make the changes that hopefully we need to make. And it's very sad at the end of this that I'm having to say there is no further pathway for these individuals right now. It does not exist. And what I would say, um, I'm happy for people to contact you, Hugh, and for me to draw up. I have a long list of names. I'm or whatever. your number. You can give <laughs> them my number, yeah. So we, we have actually, we're looking with colleagues to set up a pathway, actually, as a result of um, the non-response from the summit. So we are looking at that right now. So there's quite Charity. a few. No, actually, uh, down a different route, which okay. I which I won't talk about right now. But we are looking at um, setting up the pathway to be able to assess people t at the level they need to. So since the summit, I've continued the discussions with my colleagues over in the US, continued with my colleagues here, and we have that put together pretty much. And I will also be discussing that um, at a later date, perhaps. Perhaps I can come back on and discuss that with you. At yeah, that definitely. Time. Okay. Yeah, definitely. It's been uh, fascinating um disappointing at times but i know uh yeah no an important one and i've certainly been educated and i hope um the thing is even you, you know you're saying there's no there's no pathway in existence now there isn't mm. but merely the fact that we're talking about it and getting the knowledge out there for people who are suffering yeah. it makes a difference it yeah. makes a flipping difference we because it represents up. a light at the end of the tunnel exactly. for all those people yeah. who have yeah. got no idea yeah. what what they're doing they're no. going through their second third fourth fifth yeah. sixth seventh eighth round of yeah. therapy and every, and with no getting... result no you can talk to the cows come home yeah. <laughs> so I, again, we it's on a caveat i just want to sorry it's on a caveat I, this is i i, I just I've, i just want to be really careful of throwing the therapist under the bus there's a there's a well pl i am a therapist a, as well so don't uh, worry it's okay. a, i mean you know there's a there's a there's, a, there's a, a place for it and and but i think you know just come back to the point it's being applied in places where it's not effective at the moment we need to um, educate people and we have yeah. set up a um few training sessions a few training modules for people we do um, assess them to come into our training actually um and if they pass the level of standard we need them to come in at then we have been re running training modules all year we're fully booked now until february next year um, but we are starting to get the message out there and we are, we are changing the narrative to what it needs to read, the correct writing on the wall that represents the science, which is the evidence of what we should be delivering. Cool. Well, thank you for your time today and everything you're doing. Thank you. And uh, good luck in September at the Defence Select Committee. Well, we keep going. We're not going to give up until the job is done. Good. Thank and you. it's been a pleasure. Thanks very much indeed. Perfect. Thank you.